Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to UMass Extension's Invasive Insect Webinar Series. My name is Tawny Simiski. I'm an entomology specialist with UMass Extension's Landscape, Nursery, and Urban Forestry Program. And it's exciting to welcome back those of you who have joined us for all of these webinars uh, this spring and summer. And uh, welcome to those of you uh, for whom this is your first uh, broadcast. So this series is brought to you by the Landscape, Nursery, and Urban Forestry Program and UMass Extension's Fruit Program. And it is freely available to you thanks to uh, grant funding support through a specialty crop block grant program with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we thank them for their support. I also have with me here today Jeffrey Jouet, who is helping with uh, the tech Nicole, support aspects of uh, GoToWebinar. So thank you, Jeffrey. And could I bother you to progress to the next slide? All right, so just another review for those of you um, who have been with us uh, through this series, um, but updates for those of you who are just joining us today about the pesticide and association credit process. So all instructions for receiving pesticide credit, which includes today, Massachusetts categories 29, 35, 36, and the applicator's license or core license, as well as association credits uh, will be shared at the end of this webinar. So please remain on the webinar until the end to receive these instructions and to take the quiz for pesticide credit. The quiz is only required um, for those of you who are looking for pesticide credit, and there will be other instructions with regard to receiving your association credits. If you sign off the webinar uh, before taking the quiz, you unfortunately will not be allowed to retake it and will not be awarded the pesticide credit. So again, please remain with us throughout the duration of today's webinar. I also want to remind folks uh, who are using their cell phones to join us, uh, and if you are taking the quiz for pesticide credit, to please not use the back button or just kind of be careful with that because we've had folks run into issues and get kicked out while they were taking their quiz. Um, and also I want to make sure I remind all of our listeners today about the question function uh, and in GoToWebinar. So if you look at the control panel um, in today's broadcast and find the questions area, you can type in questions during the duration of the broadcast and at the end, and I will be here to answer those live today uh, during the broadcast, and we'll do a, a live question and answer at the end as well. So please don't hesitate to send those along. All right, so with that, I do have to admit that today's broadcast uh, was pre-recorded. I did that uh, because I, uh, Tawny Smiski, am your speaker today, and uh, my internet connection at home isn't the greatest, so I just wanted to avoid any unfortunate technical snafus, and uh, we've pre-recorded this. Um, so <clears throat> I will ask Jeffrey again to uh, to start playing this broadcast, and I will be here to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. So today I will be speaking to you about invasive insects of trees and shrubs in Massachusetts and providing the 2020 updates that I have thus far. Of course, a great place to begin is with winter moth. So the winter moth was first noticed as a problem defoliating trees and shrubs in the late 1990s in eastern Massachusetts. And it wasn't until 2003 when the winter moth was officially identified. So what we have here to the left of the screen is an image of an, an adult male winter moth. Male winter moths have wings and therefore are able to fly, whereas the female pictured here, she is nearly wingless and is of course unable to fly. The map pictured here is representative of an immense amount of effort by Dr. Joseph Elkington and his lab at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Each one of these circles depicts trap catches. So those that are in red and purple are captures of winter moth that were identified either by morphological identification or DNA analysis. And those that are in the light green or yellow 
uh, colored circles. Those are trap catches of a very closely related species, the Bruce Spanworm. Now, the Bruce Spanworm is actually native to Massachusetts and New England, and it is in the same genus as winter moth. So what you'll notice here is that winter moth is really sort of restricted to eastern Massachusetts, the Cape and the islands, and once you hit central mass and head west, you really get into Bruce Spanworm territory. That said, Dr. Elkington has trapped winter moth in western Massachusetts, but again, historically, the damaging populations of this insect have been restricted to the eastern areas of our state. Now, just in case uh, folks need a quick refresher, I am going to go over the life cycle of winter moth. So we know that this insect overwinters as um, eggs, which the female moth lays on host plant uh, bark. And you can see here we have some orange and uh, a bit more difficult to see. We have some blue winter moth eggs hidden amongst the lichen here. Now each adult female winter moth can lay at, at least 150 of these eggs. When she first lays them, they are green in color. Then they eventually turn this orangish color. And just prior to egg hatch in the spring, they turn blue. So that is a handy way of kind of um, monitoring when winter moth egg hatch is going to occur in the spring. And it is something that folks that are managing blueberry and apple who want to ensure that they have a healthy crop. Um, it's something that they can look for. But in our landscapes, typically we can wait um, to determine if management is necessary after observing the local population of winter moth caterpillars and the damage that the caterpillars are causing. I mentioned blueberry and apple though because winter moth caterpillars, they wriggle their way into host plant buds just as the host plant buds are first expanding in the spring. So they can cause significant damage to the parts of the blueberry or apple that would eventually turn into fruit. So that um, equals crop loss uh, for those growers. Winter moth egg hatch typically occurs in late March or early April depending upon winter temperatures or spring temperatures in Massachusetts. Um, so this is typically between 20 to 50 growing degree days using a simple average model and a base 50 Fahrenheit. Um, so Dr. Elkenden has a more specific, more complicated growing degree model that I'd be willing to share with um, others if, if they are interested in that information. But generally using that simple average base 50 well we know that winter moth egg hatch occurs between 20 to 50 growing degree days in massachusetts now winter moth caterpillars may completely defoliate their host plants um, however sort of a tattered appearance to the leaves and partial defoliation is typical um, for this insect caterpillar activity and feeding can occur until late may um, or the beginning of June, at which time the caterpillars drop from their host plants to the ground um, and the soil surface to pupate. And you can see a uh, winter moth pupa pictured here. And of course, winter moth is called winter moth because the adults of this species uh, then emerge around Thanksgiving and um, are flying much later in the year, mating, and the females are laying their eggs. And winter moth adults can be active until sometime in January, depending upon winter temperatures. Host plants, of course, include oak, maple, cherry, crab apple, blueberry, and others. But the most exciting part about my 2020 update about winter moth is, of course, represented in this uh, data from Dr. Joseph Elkington's lab at UMass Amherst. Um, so Dr. Elkington has, and, and uh, the folks in his lab have worked very hard to um, find and um, get approval and release a biological control organism for the winter moth. So they have been releasing Cyzenus albicans, a par parasitic fly, it's a tachinid fly, um, that specifically attacks winter moth um, for the 
management of this insect or the biological control of winter moth for many years. So each one of these six graphs represents a location in Massachusetts where they have released Cyzenus albicans and the lines in red uh, show the density of winter moth pupae uh, per sampling year and um, the lines in blue show us the percent parasitism by Cyzenus albicans. Um, so this is awesome, <laughs> essentially. What you see here is that in red, the uh, density of winter moth pupae dropping as the percent parasitism from Cyzenus albicans is increasing at many of these sites. Um, so that's exactly what you would hope to see in any successful biological control program. And so, of course, Dr. Elkinton and his lab, um, we should all give them a hand, a round of applause for uh, the work that they have done to help reduce the damaging populations of winter moth in eastern Massachusetts and um, uh, parts of New England. Dr. Elkinton, of course, would be the first to tell you that the story is more complex than, than just Cyzenus albicans. Um, he credits our native predators, which include insects like ground beetles and small mammals, uh, with also uh, decreasing the winter moth population in these locations where Cyzenus albicans has taken a big enough bite, so to speak, out of the population uh, to make it possible for these predators to also come in and have a more significant impact, possibly, on the winter moth population. So excellent news and a great uh, 2020 update for this insect. Okay, so switching over to gypsy moth. I'm not sure that you can talk about invasive insects in Massachusetts without also talking about gypsy moth. This insect is one that we have been familiar with since the 1860s, the late 1860s in our state. Uh, gypsy moth actually was, was first um, accidentally introduced into Medford, Massachusetts by an amateur entomologist, Etienne Truvelo. Now Truvelo was also uh, in his time an accomplished astronomer, so I always like to credit him with that because he also has the unfortunate legacy of bringing us gypsy moth. Um, so this non-native insect um, Particularly, the gypsy moth that we have is from Europe, it's from France. Um, it is active in Massachusetts beginning in the end of April uh, to May. That is when the gypsy moth eggs hatch, so we'll go over a bit of a life cycle review. So the egg masses of gypsy moth, they overwinter. Each egg mass um, can hold uh, 500 or more eggs. These are laid on the trunks and branches of host plants, but also pretty much on any flat surface. Um, hatch occurs between 90 to 100 growing degree days using, again, a simple average model and a base 50 Fahrenheit. Um, this occurs between the end of April to May, depending upon the season. The teeny tiny gypsy moth caterpillars are capable of dispersing uh, by using a method known as ballooning. So they will spin a silken thread and kind of dangle and catch the wind in order to blow to a new host plant or to a, no, a new location when they are first hatched and very small. Caterpillars um, then can continue to feed uh, throughout uh, May and into June, at, at which point um, they will pupate and the adults will emerge roughly around July in Massachusetts. So we have pictured here the adult male who is sort of this dark brown with maybe some black lines and these big uh, beautiful feathered antennae which he uses to locate the adult female uh, which is white in color with these, these thin uh, black antennae. Um, it's important to note that even though our gypsy moth have wings, the females are flightless, 
So those males are using their antennae to seek out the pheromones of the, the female so that they can mate and then the females will lay their eggs. Host plants include oaks, apple, alder, poplar, willow, maple, um, in addition to uh, conifers. So in heavy population years, years where we have had outbreaks of gypsy moth in Ma Massachusetts, uh, white pine and spruce can even be defoliated, even though they are not favored host plants for this insect, but once they've stripped basically everything else, including their, their favorite hosts, which are certain species of oak, um, they will move on to these, these conifers. And then, of course, gypsy moth has a gigantic host list, which is not all represented here. But uh, the excellent update for 2020 is that our recent outbreak that has occurred between roughly 2015 um, to 2018 has collapsed. So we are all very thankful for that. So this is a good time to point out a new short video series that I have uh, recently begun uh, taking advantage of maybe some extra time at home because of the lack of a commute during the pandemic um, and my wonderful husband's willingness to train me on the basics of video editing, but I've put together a short series of uh, videos that I'm calling Insect Examiner that are available at our website here, and we can show uh, a short segment of the Insect Examiner for Gypsy Moth, but I really encourage you to visit our website and check out these three-minute episodes that we have on Gypsy Moth. Um, I also have information available about lily leaf beetle and the euonymus caterpillar and more insects will be added to this video series soon. So just um, to revisit what happened in this most recent gypsy moth outbreak, I can't help but talk about this insect. As you all will well remember, in 2017, that was the peak, the height of the gypsy moth defoliation in our most recent outbreak uh, from this insect. So we had over 923,000 acres in Massachusetts alone defoliated by gypsy moth caterpillars. And this map is uh, courtesy of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. It also shows their egg mass surveys uh, that they did in 2017. And luckily in 2018, we had a reduction in gypsy moth uh, defoliation across Massachusetts, uh, pictured here in green. On this map, we had uh, just over 159,000 acres of defoliation. So while still significant, that certainly pales in comparison to what was seen in 2017. We were a bit nervous at the end of 2018 after the adult females laid their egg masses, um, however, because shockingly, even though we had a decrease in the population that year, um, there were a lot of gypsy moth egg masses uh, that uh, mass DCR had noted um, in these locations represented in, in red, particularly where they estimated that there could potentially be severe defoliation again in 2019. But thankfully, um, since the summer of 2017, when Entomophaga mymiga, a caterpillar killing fungus that is specific to gypsy moth, since that hit the population very hard, in say uh, June and the end of June and in July of, of 
2017, we have had a very healthy population of this particular fungus present in Massachusetts and luckily have had uh, decent cooperation with the weather, um, ensuring enough moisture so that the fungus can spread to the gypsy moth caterpillar. So these pictures are from 2019 from Boylston, Leicester, and Amherst, Massachusetts, where you can see the uh, deceased gypsy moth caterpillars hanging vertically um, from the trunks of these trees. Those caterpillars are likely um, killed by Entomophaga mimiga, the fungus. Fungus killed caterpillars tend to kind of shrivel up and dry out and hang vertically, whereas we have a caterpillar um, here in this photo that is hanging in this inverted V shape um, and is likely still quite kind of juicy for a lack of a better way of describing it. Um, that caterpillar was probably killed by the NPV virus which is specific to gypsy moth caterpillars. Um, so those are sort of some field characteristics that can, you can use to look at deceased gypsy moth caterpillars to estimate where the origins of their mortality may have begun. That said, co-infections are possible and really to um, identify whether it was the fungus or the virus killing the caterpillars. Um, you have to look at the cadavers under a microscope. But for our purposes, we do know, um, and Dr. Elkinton's lab did do some sampling during the most recent gypsy moth uh, outbreak, we do know that the uh, fungus Entomophaga mimiga had a massive epizootic, which is credited with reducing the gypsy moth population in Massachusetts and uh, other areas of New England that were also dealing with this. So in 2019, the story was even better. So uh, it's very difficult to see but on this map, but the areas shown in orange, those represent the acres that were defoliated by gypsy moths. So there are still a couple in various um, parts of the state, but we had uh, of course, just over 9,000, or just under 10,000, rather, um, acres of defoliation in 2019 due to gypsy moths. So we certainly um, hope and believe that that will continue, um, at least in the recent future, uh, to be the trend that Entomophaga mimiga, that fungus, will keep our gypsy moth population at bay. Okay, so let's transition from defoliating invasive insect pests to a wood boring invasive insect pest. So like many other states, Massachusetts is dealing with the emerald ash borer. This is a non-native bucrestid or jewel beetle whose larvae are the most destructive stage uh, of this insect. It was first detected in western Massachusetts in 2012 and um, has since spread throughout much of the state. Adult emerald ash borers emerge around 450 growing degree days, base 50 Fahrenheit. Um, so using that average growing degree day model, uh, this is typically sometime around May and June in Massachusetts. The adult beetles can fly, they mate, and the females lay teeny tiny eggs in the cracks and crevices of ash tree bark. Um, so I have eggs uh, pictured here. Um, this white egg was freshly laid by an emerald ash borer female and they change color um, as the eggs age. Each female can lay approximately 150 or more um, eggs which will hatch and then the larvae bore uh, beneath the bark and uh, feed in the vascular system of the host plants uh, effectively girdling the the trees um, so again this larval stage is the most destructive stage of this insect just a little bit about emerald ash borer larvae ID I do want to point out these sort of bell-shaped abdominal segments here. Uh, that is helpful if you are trying to compare um, or determine if you have an emerald ash borer larva compared to some other native bucrestids that can also be found in our ash trees. Um, 
but other signs that you can look for to detect an emerald ash borer infestation in your ash include these D-shaped exit holes that are created when the adults emerge um, and they are left behind. Host plants for emerald ash borer, of course, include most commonly white, green, and black ash, but um, there have also been records of emerald ash borer infesting white fringe tree, which are uh, related to, to our ash, but of course, Fraxinus is the genus that is most significantly impacted by this non-native beetle. So here is the picture um, thus far, uh, well up to March of 2020 for emerald ash borer in Massachusetts. So unfortunately, we know that this insect is present in at least 11 of our counties, which are listed here. The um, newest of those that has been, um, where, where emerald ash borer has been detected is of course Franklin County. Uh, pictured here so we can see that that detection was made in, in 2020. Between 2019 and 2020, at least 68 um, communities have been added to this map. Um, so the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation and their Forest Health Program has confirmed um, that all of the towns pictured here uh, in color on this map have had confirmed emerald ash borer detections and this again is as of March 3rd of this year so I know this map is going to be updated uh, shortly and again as mentioned emerald ash borer was first detected in Berkshire County in 2012 and you can see the sort of spectrum of detections that have occurred uh, right up until this year. I will note that most of the ash resource in Massachusetts is located in our forests in Western Mass. Um, that being said, we need to always remember that Fraxinus um, is a popular genus for urban uh, forests, for street tree plantings. So many communities across Massachusetts will be dealing with the aftermath of, of what happens when emerald ash borer infests their ash trees, eventually they decline, uh, die, and become hazardous. So this is something, unfortunately, like many other states, uh, we are dealing with in mass. The silver lining on the horizon, hopefully, uh, with regard to the emerald ash borer story, uh, has to do with uh, different species of biocontrols that have been released by the states, the federal government, um, as well as university partners including here in Massachusetts. Uh, three notable species uh, include these teeny tiny parasitic wasps. They are non-stinging. I know maybe when I say wasps that can be nerve wracking for folks to think of them being released uh, for emerald ash borer biocontrol, but again, they do not sting humans. Um, these, these three wasps are parasitoids of various life stages of the emerald ash borer. So we have here to the left of your screen, Tetrasticus planipanisi. This is a larval parasitoid. Uh, it is a gregarious endoparasitoid. So that means that many um, Tetrasticus wasps will be born from a single emerald ash borer larva and the fact that it is an endoparasitoid means that the larvae of these wasps develop inside um, the emerald ash borer larva. We have here Oobius agrilli. This is an egg parasitoid so you can see that this wasp is laying her egg inside the egg of an emerald ash borer. It is a one-to-one -one ratio so you get one Oobius wasp um, per emerald ash borer egg. And then Spathius galini is one of the newer biocontrols on the scene. And this is a larval parasitoid that is a gregarious. So again, there are multiple Spathius galini that are born from a single emerald ash borer larva. Um, and, but this time it is an ectoparasitoid. So this means that this particular wasp's larvae develop on the outside of an emerald ash borer larva. Not a great way for the emerald ash borer to go, but hopefully this is a long-term solution, particularly 
in our forest settings to help drop emerald ash borer populations below damaging levels. Uh, the hope really is to preserve some of our Fraxinus in North America and certainly in Massachusetts. One last um, resource that I would like to point everyone to, I'm sure you've seen this, but if you have not, uh, take a look at the third edition of the insecticide options for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer. Um, this was produced through a collaborative effort by a lot of excellent entomologists across the country. Um, it includes information uh, obviously uh, about uh, insecticide options for protecting and treating ash trees. This ranges from soil applied systemics, trunk injected systemics, uh, systemic basal trunk sprays to protective uh, cover sprays. And they do a great job of talking about the environmental impacts of all of these options and really going into detail uh, regarding the research that has been done uh, with regard to the efficacy and timing of these these management options. So if you really want to have your uh, frequently asked questions answered, if you want to kind of fine tune and hone your uh, management and treatment programs for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer, I highly recommend uh, checking out this this guide and it is available freely online. So another wood boring beetle that of course we cannot skip over when talking about invasive insects in Massachusetts is certainly the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is probably the most infamous invasive insect. I, I think maybe the most well known. Um, certainly uh, it is not something that we hope to have in our state, although we do, um, and it is not something that we hope other states will have to deal with. Although I do have listed here, I, I just feel like this is a grand indicator of the type of year 2020 has been. Of course, um, a, a, an additional detection of Asian longhorn beetle has been made. And I don't say that to uh, make light of how excellent it was that this particular infestation was noticed by a homeowner and reported to the proper authorities. So that is exactly what we hope will happen, that homeowners will keep their eyes open and report any suspicious beetles or damage, particularly on maple trees that they see. Um, but again, it is unfortunate that South Carolina has been added to this list. And I know the USDA APHIS and their partners are uh, in the in South in South Carolina are in the process of delimiting and figuring out the extent of that particular infestation. So Asian longhorn beetle is managed in a little bit of a different way than a lot of our invasive insects in the sense that because of the biology of this insect, there is an opportunity uh, to eradicate the Asian longhorn beetle um, through some very costly and extensive and intense um, manage management methods, um, but it can be done as evidenced here. So the infestations in Chicago, uh, in New Jersey, and in Boston, Massachusetts, thankfully, um, have been declared eradicated. But there are still active Asian longhorn beetle eradication programs in New York, uh, Massachusetts, Ohio, and um, unfortunately, possibly soon to be in South Carolina. Although again, fingers crossed that maybe that is only a couple of trees that they can cut, chip, and get rid of that infestation. So we'll be thinking of them and hoping for the best for South Carolina. Asian longhorn beetle, of course, is well known as an, a pest of maple, so of Acer. Uh, particularly our red maples, but it also likes sugar maple, which is, of course, um, something on everyone's minds who likes their pancakes with maple syrup. Um, but you can see here the host plant list for Asian longhorn beetle is quite extensive. So there are, it's not just maples, there are 12 total genera that are impacted or have the potential to be impacted by this insect. 
a little bit about uh, adult identification. I think it's important to use this time to spend um, on a refresher of adult larval uh, and damage identification. Again, thinking about South Carolina, hoping we don't find any more infestations of Asian longhorn beetle, but it is helpful for everyone to know what they're looking for so that they can report any suspicious insects or damage because that's really how we get a handle on managing this invasive pest. Um, so we have here uh, images of Asian longhorn beetles. We have a male with the much longer antennae and a female Asian longhorn beetle. And then we have one of its most common native uh, lookalikes, the white spotted pine sawyer. So what you need to look for here we notice that we've got these sort of white spots on the elytra or hardened um, forewings on these Asian longhorn beetles and some of these white spots on our white spotted pine sawyer. But the key difference is the color of the scutellum. So the scutellum is this little point sort of, I call it between the, the shoulder blades, if you will, of the, the beetle. So right behind the, the head um, and the thorax and at the, the top of the wings here. So in Asian longhorn beetle, that is black, whereas on our white spotted pine sawyer, the scutellum is white. So that is a way that you can kind of differentiate between the adult identification uh, for the Asian longhorn beetle. However, if you find a suspicious insect that looks similar to the Asian longhorn beetle and you are unsure about its identification and you live in Massachusetts, I should say, please call 508-852-8090. That is the number for the Asian longhorn beetle eradication program and they can help confirm that you hopefully do not have an Asian longhorn beetle and I think they are very happy to do that because again, uh, it, is, it is helpful to find an Asian longhorn beetle infestation early. If you have to have one, you want to find it early so you can remove just a couple of trees and eradicate it before it gets um, to be a significant problem in your area. Larval identification is going to be quite a bit more difficult. Um, and again, I would leave this up to the experts. I, I wouldn't try to confirm an ALB larva for yourself. But if you are chip, um, cutting up firewood um, or you know working with hazard tree removal and you find some suspicious external damage and you crack, say, a maple open and you find these big um, cerambicid larvae, um, that might be something, especially if it's a maple, you just want to reach out and get that confirmed. So um, entomologists and specialists are going to be looking at certain characteristics on the um, uh, thoracic section of the, the Asian longhorn beetle larva. They're going to be looking around the mouth parts. Um, again, this is not a situation where you want to be trying to figure this out yourself. So if you find that you've just pulled one of these out of something uh, that looks like an inf possibly infested maple tree. Again, if you're in Massachusetts, you want to call 508-852-8090. So just a little review of the situation in Worcester, Massachusetts. That is where Asian longhorn beetle was detected in 2008. Again, reported by a homeowner. Um, so we encourage homeowners to be vigilant and report any suspicious insects. The regulated area for Asian longhorn beetle is currently 110 square miles. This includes Worcester, Shrewsbury, Boylston, West Boylston, and parts of Holden and Auburn, Massachusetts, which you can see is located uh, right around Central Mass here. So these two maps are courtesy of the USDA APHIS and they show the regulated area for Asian longhorn beetle in central Massachusetts. So of course we can see Worcester and the surrounding towns that have been impacted by this infestation. Um, <clears throat> the map on the right depicts in these little red dots that are surrounded sort of by this gray background, all of the historically infested trees that were detected in these areas, so trees that did have uh, Asian longhorn beetle in them, 
Uh, more than 35,000 trees have been removed due to this insect in this area of Massachusetts, and this includes infested trees as well as high-risk uh, removals. Um, so in addition to the 35,000 individual trees, there have been high-risk removals of full host acreage to help combat uh, Asian longhorn beetle in Massachusetts. Uh, so this has been an extensive effort on behalf of the USDA APHIS, as well as partnering state agencies, the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation, um, as well as outreach efforts from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. So we certainly appreciate everything that they're all doing. Extensive and excellent replanting programs have um, also replaced the trees uh, removed by this eradication effort with non-Asian longhorn beetle hosts. So over 30,000 trees have been replanted in these areas. So that effort should also be applauded. Just a quick review of the life cycle of the Asian longhorn beetle. So the uh, adults emerge and uh, feed for 10 to 14 days and then they will mate. And so then the female beetles will chew an egg site or multiple egg sites in the bark of their host plants. And then they will lay a single egg in each of these locations. And eggs are about the size and look like um, a grain of rice. Up to 90 eggs can be laid per female. The larva hatches uh, within two weeks and bores just beneath the bark and begins feeding. As these larvae age and grow larger in size, they bore deeper into the tree uh, up to 13 instars or different um, sizes of these larvae have been reported and then pupation takes uh, 13 to 24 days. The entire life cycle of the Asian longhorn beetle can take a single year in some locations um, but it can take up to two years in others so we suspect in Massachusetts and um, in cooler areas, uh, cooler climated areas where Asian longhorn beetle exists that the life cycle can take up to two years. So mentioning the life cycle is important uh, when we're learning to recognize Asian longhorn beetle damage to their host plants. So obviously these images show extensively damaged trees from this insect. So uh, right now, the situation in Worcester um, is not one where they are seeing trees that are damaged to this extent. They're in the sort of needle in a haystack phase where they're looking for a few egg sites here and there, maybe a few exit holes um, to detect the infestation of this insect and, and get those trees removed. But these images show you the extent of the damage and the reason why Asian longhorn beetle is, is so seriously managed. Um, you can see extensive damage um, uh, in these, these sections here from the feeding larvae. These images also depict the perfectly round exit holes from emerging adults, as well as the egg sites chewed by the female beetles. So zooming in on those uh, a bit more, um, this photograph shows two uh, pretty freshly chewed Asian longhorn beetle egg sites. Uh, the eggs will have been laid in the center of each of these uh, oviposition sites or egg laying sites. And on the edges, it's uh, nice to point out that you can see the mandible marks um, from the female beetle as she chews these locations to lay her eggs. That's important to note because sometimes squirrels uh, will chew uh, the bark of trees and uh, they can create damage that uh, can be tricky to differentiate from uh, that of an Asian longhorn beetle egg site. This is an example of an Asian longhorn beetle exit hole. Again, they are perfectly round and uh, that is the hole from which uh, a mature adult will emerge from the host plant. Uh, when it is ready. One thing you can do with, uh, say you find a maple with these perfectly round exit holes and you're nervous that this could be Asian longhorn beetle is to stick a number two pencil inside it. It will go straight back and um, 
will fit just within that hole so that gives you uh, an idea for size. There are other insects that can create uh, similar damage in maple and um, other uh, host plants that are hosts for Asian longhorn beetle. Um, so there can be some confusion that occurs. However, the most important thing to reiterate again is that if you find yourself in this situation, please call 508-852-8090. Again, that's the number for if you are in Massachusetts. Um, please call and report any suspicious damage that you believe may be caused by the Asian longhorn beetle, particularly if it is on uh, maple. So again, to remind everyone, if you suspect Asian longhorn beetle in Massachusetts, um, here is the local Worcester office number again. You can also call toll free at this 866 number or you can report it online here. So if you report it to the massnrc.org uh, slash pests webpage, that will be a report that goes to our Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. And for those of you who are tuning in uh, or watching this recording uh, from other states and other locations, you can also report Asian longhorn beetle to the USDA APHIS at their website, um, and they will sort of triage you to uh, your um, most local area. Okay, of course, uh, we have to talk about the spotted lanternfly. I know this has been a topic in many of the webinars um, in this series that, that we have hosted. But of course, um, this insect is on everyone's minds and it's something that we certainly do not want to add to the list of invasive species here in Massachusetts. So uh, as of now, the spotted lanternfly has not been detected in Massachusetts with the exception of a single um, uh, dead individual detection, um, but with respect to an established population of spotted lanternfly somewhere in our landscape in Massachusetts, that has not yet occurred, and we hope it never occurs. So this uh, species is also sometimes referred to as a lantern moth. Um, this terminology makes things a little bit confusing because the spotted lanternfly is neither a fly nor a moth. It is an insect in the order Hemiptera, so these are the true bugs, the cicadas, hoppers, aphids, and others. Um, and it is a member of the family Fulgoridae, so these are also known as the plant hoppers. So this map is excellent. It's from the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, and it gives us sort of an overview of the known infestation in Pennsylvania. Um, and other um, states here we can see these areas that are outlined in red um, and highlighted in blue that indicates um, areas where spotted lanternfly populations are known to the landscape in these states. Um, you will also uh, notice these little uh, sort of pinkish purple dots. Those are representative of individual finds of spotted lanternfly where no infestation uh, is present. So the scary thing for us in Massachusetts is that, of course, we had one of these such finds in Suffolk County. So we know the spotted lanternfly is really good at uh, hitching rides and uh, finding its way into new locations with human assisted movement. And of course, the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources urged us in February of 2019 to check plants for the spotted lanternfly for this reason. So back in 2019, there was a discovery of a single adult insect um, that was deceased and confirmed in a potted plant um, in a private re residence in Boston. Um, so again, this is a reminder of the necessity to be vigilant and keep an eye out for the spotted lanternfly. And just to note, um, we do know that spotted lanternfly has an association with Ailanthus altissima or the tree of heaven. This is an invasive plant, an invasive tree. Spotted lanternfly shows a preference to mate on tree of heaven. Uh, research as to why this happens is ongoing. Um, Tree of Heaven does have allelopathic chemicals in its leaves, its roots, its bark, and those help prevent 
the establishment or limit the establishment of other plants that would otherwise be growing nearby. Um, so perhaps um, spotted lanternfly has some association with this tree in its life cycle to make use of those chemicals. Uh, again, the research is ongoing. But I mention this because if you know of locations where Tree of Heaven is present in Massachusetts, that is a good spot to look for the spotted lanternfly. The impact is uh, pretty significant, and this slide was shared by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Um, they have let us all know that adults in high populations can be disruptive to residents and certainly impact daily life. You can see this tree absolutely coated in adult spotted lanternfly. We have some swings and child's um, uh, toys here, and I'm certain that um, these homeowners are not happy to be sharing this area with these insects. So the quality of life um, for many has been changed in states that are dealing with spotted lanternfly. And of course, this is a reason why we do not want this insect in Massachusetts. And we can see here, um, these are some plants that uh, the honeydew or excrement that spotted lanternflies as piercing sucking insects feeding on plant fluids then excrete this sugary liquid. Um, it has coated these plants and then there's a little bit of sooty mold growing on top of uh, that honeydew. So spotted lanternfly overall in our landscapes is a nuisance by producing honeydew, which attracts stinging insects and promotes the growth of sooty mold. Longer term impacts to trees and shrubs are yet unknown. Um, however, for nurseries, when thinking about landscape and nursery, um, they have noted increased labor costs for nurseries to meet quarantine requirements in areas that are impacted by the spotted lantern fly. So of course, again, this is an insect that we hope to never have to interact with here in Massachusetts. And so if you suspect spotted lantern fly in Massachusetts, please take a photo of the insect. So if you believe you found an egg mass, a nymph, or an adult, take a picture, uh, collect a specimen if you can safely do so. Uh, definitely note your location and then report it online here. Again, go to the massnrc.org slash pests webpage and report any suspicious insects that you believe to be spotted lanternfly. Now, I have not gone over the life cycle or identification of this insect specifically because um, spotted lanternfly has been discussed extensively in this series of webinars. Um, so if you visit our Invasive Insect Webinars page on our Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program uh, website with UMass Extension, you can find recordings of previous webinars where spotted lanternfly has been discussed, including details about identification as well as biology. And so with that, I am sure I have run out of time for today. So I do want to remind you of some of UMass Extension's resources. So again, please visit our webpage, ag.umass.edu slash landscape. Um, so this is the Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program webpage. And I do want to call your attention to our landscape message, especially if you are in Massachusetts, but folks from other states are welcome to have a look at this educational newsletter as well. We provide information about weather and general conditions, insect and disease and weed activity, growing degree day reports, phenology um, and pest management strategies and more. So please have a look at the landscape message. You can also subscribe to our email list. You can also please like and follow us on Facebook at UMass Extension Landscape where we try to share as much information as we can. And then lastly, I do want to make an announcement about UMass Extension's Green School. Um, so Green School occurs every other year on even years. So of course, 2020 is a Green School year. Normally this is an intensive um, in-person educational opportunity from October to December. Uh, this year we've made 
the decision to take Green School virtual. So this means that this offering will be available to, I think, a much wider audience um, for folks that can't necessarily travel to Massachusetts to join us. Um, so please, again, visit our website, ag.umass.edu slash Green School for more information about this program. So we have a landscape management, arboriculture, and turf management track. Um, and you can see we do get some very positive feedback about this, this program that is a collaboration between the UMass Extension Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program, as well as UMass Extension's turf program. So we do hope that you will join us if you are able. And with that, thank you so very much for your attention and for listening. And I will take any questions uh, that I can. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we um, may have interrupted the recording at the yeah. end. Thank you. Hi everyone, sorry about that. I uh, started talking and I seem to be muted. So <laughs> um, I do wanna take uh, folks questions that we already have and I know we're running low on time. So if I do not get to your question, please email me. And you can see my email address, tsimiski at umass.edu on your screen. Um, so one question we had from Mary was, she was wondering if the tachinid fly or Cyzenus albicans for the biological control of winter moth uh, has any impact on the monarch butterfly population. And um, my response to that is uh, that Cyzenus albicans um, is very specific to the winter moth species, which is the main reason why it was considered a biological control option um, for managing the, the winter moth. So <clears throat> if you uh, go to the the chat function in GoToWebinar. I have shared a couple of links uh, to more information about Dr. Joseph Elkington's research using Cyzenus albicans, and it explains how uh, that tachinid fly was used in Canada to successfully suppress winter moth uh, populations and also talks about the host specificity of that insect. So again, we do not anticipate any negative impact to the monarch butterfly population uh, because of Cyzenus Cyzenus albicans. Again, it's specific to winter moth. Um, we had a question from Ruth. Please explain the difference in the initial ID photo of the gypsy moth caterpillar showing its red dots um, and blue dots and the photos that followed where the caterpillars appeared to be solid black with those, those dots um, absent. Uh, I really appreciate that question, Ruth. Thank you for asking that. And again, I want to refer everybody to the chat section. Uh, in GoToWebinar and look for the link to our insect examiner series that I started to show you uh, in today's presentation. Uh, that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to start Insect Examiner to show that um, insects have um, very different appearances throughout their, their life cycle. So when gypsy moth caterpillars first hatch from their eggs, they are teeny tiny. They also look vastly different um, from the large, brightly colored, sort of red and blue warted um, late instar caterpillars that we're all used to seeing uh, photos of. So again, um, if you visit the webpage that I shared in the, the chat section uh, and watch the insect examiner on gypsy moth, you will see um, a great example of how different the caterpillars are throughout their, their life cycle and the different instars. Um, Melissa asked about a link to the um, insecticide options for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer. I have shared that as well in the chat section with the link to Insect Examiner and our Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program webpage uh, that I invite everybody to check out and keep an eye on for future educational programs. And I still have a couple of questions, but it is one o'clock, so I do want to go through our process for um,